I, Dr. Sumya Das, Associate Professor, Noida Institute of Engineering and Technology, Pharmacy Institute, welcome you all on the third day of AIPD sponsored Atal Epic on the topic oh, Cancer and Health System. Now, I would like to introduce our today's second speaker, Dr. Ritu Gupta, ma'am. Dr. Ritu Gupta worked as assistant professor at Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences and established diagnostic laboratories in the newly created Department of Hematology. Later, she returned to laboratory oncology unit at the Ames and is currently she is a professor and officer in charge of this unit. Professor Gupta leads as the principal investigation investigator of unit of excellence on multiple myeloma and center of advanced research and education on acute myeloid lymphoma. Her major research interests pertain to transitional research in hematological malignancies. Her laboratory has pioneered several major findings of clinical importance in hepato-oncology in India. Her most remarkable achievements during the last few years include establishment of several hematological investigations of clinical relevance in, in hematolymphoid malignancies, as well as setting up laboratory protocols for the state of art technologies for the research purposes. On the oncological front, she has established protocols for minimal residual disease estimation in hematolymphoid malignancies and published several papers, especially on the multiple myeloma. Established IGHV somatic mutation detection and ZAP70 assay for the evaluation of patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia and poppy number variations of detection in hematolymphoid malignancies. Few of the research strategies established include protocols for the evaluation of Treg and TH17 cells, rare event analysis for enumeration of stem cells and circulating endothelial progenitor cells. Considering the challenges in detecting low levels of residual malignant cells, her laboratory is working in collaboration with leading technological institutes of the country to develop image processing modules to address minimum residual disease detection. I would like to welcome you, ma'am, in NIT Pharmacy Institute. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us. Welcome, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And I thank Dr. Mazumda for uh, inviting me yes. to be part of this uh, educational activity. And uh, I would uh, like to start sharing my screen. But All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third day of this faculty development program. Um, in the past two days, I've also heard the lectures along with you from the eminent speakers and uh, you heard a lot about the cancer genomics in various uh, cancers. So today I'm going to give you a different flavor by talking about the relevance of cancer genomics in clinical practice from an oncologist perspective. So since I'm a hematopathologist, I work on hematological malignancies. So I have chosen one of these hematological malignancies as the prototype to describe the how the concepts of cancer genomics and how the information generated from this platform is used in clinical practice. So before I go on to the role of cancer genomics in multiple myeloma impacting the clinical practice, I would like to talk in very brief about what this disease is. So multiple myeloma is a hematological malignancy, which is which belongs to a group of plasma cell proliferative disorders. Now, this group of disorders have two features in common. One, there is a clonal expansion of plasma cells. Now, what is the function of plasma cells? It is to secrete immunoglobulins. So when a single clone is expanding, so obviously they will secrete a similar kind of immunoglobulin, which is known as the monoclonal or the M protein. Now, the clinical manifestations of this disease are due to the clonal expansion of the plasma cells interaction with the tumor microenvironment and secondly, because of the secretion of this M protein. Now, let's look at the clinical manifestation of myeloma in brief. On the bottom left, you can see a pictorial representation of the plasma cells. These are large cells 
with eccentric nucleus and deep amphiphilic cytoplasm, which is because of the presence of abundant amount of immunoglobulins in their cytoplasm. Now, when they secrete the similar kind of monoclonal protein or the immunoglobulin, it leads to the form a generation of a band, a single dense band on the serum protein electrophoresis, which you're seeing on your right. So on the rightmost is the normal banding pattern that you see from the normal sedum, where you see albumin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, heptoglobin, transferrin complement, which are the normal proteins present in the serum. But in case of multiple myeloma patient, you can see on the uh, left-hand side where the M band is marked, you see a dense band. So this is how the patients are diagnosed. In addition to this, hello, ma. So, sorry to interrupt. The file is uh, means the slides are not moving forward. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is now in that slide. It is now in third slide. Third slide, right? So, yeah. all right. So I think I have uh, not put it in slide mode now. So is, if yes, it is ma similar, I'll not in slide mode. mode. It is uh, not in full screen. Yes. So, not in full screen, but can you see them? Let me try again to put it in the slideshow mode. Is my yeah, third yeah. slide visible now? Yes, it's visible. All right. Please stop me if it is not visible. Okay. So now since the slide was not visible on the bottom left, you can see the plasma cells. Now these plasma cells secrete the M protein, which is visible on the serum protein electrophoresis, which you can see on the rightmost side. The rightmost uh, column shows the normal electrophoresis pattern of the serum proteins, whereas on the left you can see an M band, which is a dense band and is visible. Now, because of this M band, there the charge in the peripheral blood chain on different cells in the peripheral blood, especially the red blood cell, changes, and as a, as a result instead of lying separated from each other, they tend to clump together. And this phenomenon is known as the rule formation. In addition, now these plasma cells interact with the osteoclastogenic excess of the, within the bone marrow and induce the osteoclastic activity. As a result, you can see these translucent punched out lytic lesions in the skull and in the long bones. But what is debilitating is these punched out lesions in the vertebra, which ultimately leads to collapse of the vertebra and the patients tend to develop severe back pain. These plasma cells do also migrate to the extramedullary sites and give rise to tumors there, which are generally picked up on PET scan. So this is about the disease, the clinical manifestations of the disease. Now, what we are interested is in the pathogenesis of this disease. So you are aware that the B cells, the mature B cells reside in the germinal center of the lymph nodes. From here, they mature and they divide into the memory B cells and the terminally differentiated plasma cells and move out, the plasma cells move out of the germinal centers. And now they have the function of making immunoglobulins for different against different antigens and against different molecules. So what happens is that in this stage, when some of these plasma cells acquire what we call as the primary cytogenetic abnormalities of myeloma, it gives rise to a pre-malignant condition known as monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or MGAS. So now, uh, myeloma is an interesting disease because it has a well-defined pre-malignant stage, which is known as the MGAS. At this stage, the primary cytogenetic aberrations have already taken place and which are the hyperdiploidy, which is the duplication of the odd number of chromosomes and the translocation involving the IGH gene, which is located on chromosome 14 Q. As the time passes, these patients only 1% at the rate of 1% per year tend to progress to an advanced stage, which is known as the smoldering multiple myeloma. At this time, the malignant clone has set in and has established itself, but the disease is not yet symptomatic, which means that the patients usually do not reach the doctor at this stage. And they reach when the disease, when the, this malignant clone, which has established itself, proliferates. So at the stage of MGUS, the malignant clone does not have a very high proliferative potential, 
and only some of these patients progress. But at the smoldering myeloma stage, the clone has established itself and has acquired a proliferative potential. And five, at the rate of 5% per year, these patients progress to overt symptomatic disease, which is known as the multiple myeloma. During this process, the plasma cells continuously keep on acquiring the structural and as well as the uh, single nucleotide variations. Now you can see on the bottom, by progressing from the MGA stage to MM, there is a progressive acquirement of various mutations in the driver genes. The antigen exposure, the mutagens, the bone marrow microenvironment, the age, the diet, the obesity, and the other immunological factors shape up this transition from the pre-malignant stage to the malignant stage. But what is the advantage or what is the significance of acquiring this knowledge? Can we harness this information for the benefit of patients? Yes, we can, but before that we need to know that is the tumor genome unique for the disease? Which means do all the patients of smoldering multiple myeloma or multiple myeloma will have similar structural variations or will have similar mutations in their different genes or the changes are unique to each patient. So this is the question that we wanted to address and I'll show you the data regards. So uh, to address these two issues that whether the tumor, uh, whether these um, genomic aberrations are unique to the tumor or unique to each patient, we evaluated 82 patients of multiple myeloma and uh, we isolated uh, plasma cells from their bone marrow. So then uh, we did a whole exome sequencing using the standard Illumina platform. As you can see that these are the standard uh, analysis pipelines which are used. So on the bottom, you can see the five colored highlighted boxes. This is the data that I'm going to discuss with you today and how it impacts our clinical decision making. I have moved to the left next slide. If it is visible, just say yes. Shall I continue? Yes, ma'am, please continue. Yes, I yeah. think one of you keep yourself unmuted and just tell me, you know, when to continue because otherwise it, it is waste. I mean, a lot of time is going in this. Uh, Dr. Okay. Soumya, you please, uh, right. after one slide, you please. Uh, okay, ma'am. So after doing this whole exome sequencing, then we looked at the landscape of the somatic mutations as is uh, uh, except, uh, expected. The non-synonymous mutations are higher than the synonymous mutations in this case. And these non-synonymous mutations could further be divided based on their location and the type of change that is happening into multiple subtypes like missense, UTR3, splice, frame shift, etc. And the missense mutations contribute maximum to these non-synonymous mutations as happens in other cancers as well. But what is important note here is that the median number of non-synonymous mutations is 53, whereas the average is 261, which tells us that in this cohort, there are some patients who have very high number of mutations and the, these are called as hypermutators. So to identify which are hypermutators, we then plotted the tumor mutation burden, which is taken as the number of mutations per megabase pair of, of the genome. So based on that, we could divide our patient cohort into low, intermediate and high TMBs. So these approximately 14% of our patients were hypermutators. But is this hypermutations occurs in the synonymous only or in non-synonymous variations also? So we found that the low people, patients with low TMB had lower synonymous as well as non-synonymous variations. And same holds true for the intermediate and high TNB patients. Now, the next, uh, a very interesting thing uh, in the past two days you have heard is that the role of TMB in cancers. So far, the only role, you know, uh, we believe that patients who are hypermutators would have an unstable genome and then they will tend to progress faster or they will respond poorly to any therapy and will have inferior survival outcomes. 
But the third most important point why TMB is being studied is because it is believed that patients who have high TMB will respond better to immunotherapy. But now with uh, as more data is pouring in, we feel that all these three concepts are, do not hold true for all the cancers. And so the evaluation of TMB is still under investigation and cannot be used for clinical decision making as of now. So when dividing these non-synonymous mutations based on their functions, we can see that some of them were in the driver genes, in oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and some were actionable. So what are the actionable mutations? Actionable mutations are those for which we have a targeted therapy. So is my next slide visible? Not now, ma'am. It's not going forward. Not able to see your next slide. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. This is Abhijit here. Ma'am, I think without going full screen, you may just open your PPT so that we can see. Actually, we are observing your uh, presentation uh, in general mode. You may exit the uh, full screen. Right now, it is okay. We can see the uh, title as a landscape of MM driver and actionable mutation. If you just press the arrow, it will be go on. Yes, Sorry. yes, yes, yes. Perfect, man. Perfect. Please okay. go ahead. All right. So uh, <clears throat> on the left side, I have plotted the driver genes and on the right, I have plotted the actionable genes. So the take home message from this slide is that in the driver genes, what we found is different from the Western data is the frequency of the driver genes in our data set. So PAP PC1 and KMT 2C were mutated in a large number of our cohort, 51 and 40 percent of our patients, whereas th these genes are mutated in approximately 10 to 15 percent of the cohorts from the Western population. So there are some changes. This slide tells us that there are some changes in the distribution or the landscape of the genomic aberrations in Indian myeloma patients vis-a-vis -vis the Western patients. But on the right side, there is an interesting phenomena that you will see. Some of the patients do not have any actionable mutation, whereas some of them have more than one actionable mutation. So overall, at least 34% of our patients had one actionable mutation. So the next question is, can these patients or can myeloma be, be treated with targeted therapy against an actionable mutation? The uh, obvious answer would be yes, but let's see what happens in actual practice. So to understand this, I will take you to the risk stratification models for this disease. As you've seen in the previous lecture also, we tend to stratify the disease into low, intermediate and high risk using various prognostic markers and predictive markers so that we know upfront which patients are doing to, going to do badly and need utmost care and which patients are going to be a good risk patient and are going to respond very well to our treatment. So for this particular disease, the high risk cytogenetic abnormalities, which are these three here, the deletion 17P and translocation 414 and 1416 are associated with the high risk disease. So we also saw that does this hold true for our Indian population? Yes, to a large extent it holds true, but there are variations in the cutoffs. So ethnic variations contribute to disease heterogeneity. Nevertheless, the genomic aberrations can stratify the patients into high risk and low risk disease. Now, we let's further understand after having understood that there are some patients who have standard risk disease and some who have high risk disease and high risk diseases because of the presence of certain genomic aberrations. Are these genomic aberrations present in all the cells in the high risk patient? And are they absent in all the patients with low and intermediate risk? I have tried to show it with this cartoon. So what is actually happening in a low intermediate or a standard risk myeloma, most of these tumor cells are of the standard risk clone, which means that they do not have these high risk cytogenetic aberrations, but they do have very few cells of the high risk clone that is possessing these one of these aberrations. So why don't we pick them up? 
the answer is simple because the technologies that we use at the time of diagnosis, we usually do not use very, very sensitive technologies at this time point. The, normally the NGS that we use is has, if you do a whole exome sequencing, can detect a mutation if it is present in at least 5% of the tumor cells. And if you use using a targeted and deep sequencing, the target is to identify more than 1% of the tumor cells carrying the mutation. So in the standard risk myeloma, if they're constituting these particular high risk clones are constituting less than 1% or less than 5%, depending on the technology that you have used, you will not be able to identify these cells. Whereas in the high risk myeloma, some of the standard risk clones would be there. Upon treatment, some of they, these will die off, some will remain. And at the time of disease relapse, various proportions of these clones would be there. So the bottom line here is to tell you that there is a clonal heterogeneity which exists within a tumor within the same patient. So if a targetable or actionable mutation is present, then I can say that it may be present in large number of tumor cells, but it is not necessary that it is present in all the tumor cells. So this was a cartoon based representation. Now let's see what happens in actual life. So when we looked at our uh, whole exome sequencing data, we found that the 50 in 58 percent of the drivers, the mutations were clonal, whereas in nearly 40 percent, the mutations were subclonal. And similarly, for the actionable mutations, only the 44 percent were the sub were the clonal, whereas the rest of the 50 percent, the mutations were subclonal. Right. So that means within a tumor, there are in even in 34 percent of the patients where you're seeing an actionable mutations, 50 percent of the times and 50 percent of the cells or more of the cells may not show that actionable mutation. So the solution is that you use a combination therapy rather than a single targeted therapy, which will be effective against almost all of the tumor cells and prevent the disease relapse. So now we know that despite all the kinds of treatment we give, patients do relapse. So is the tumor genome stable over time? or with relapse, there is a change in the tumor genome. So to understand this, we looked at the patterns of the clonal evolution in this study. So how did we evaluate the clonal evolution? What we did was we analyzed the whole exome of these patients at the diagnostic time point and at the time point when these patients relapsed or progressed. So what we found was that there were changes in the distribution of the driver genes. For some of the mutations, for some, some of the mutations in some of these driver genes, the mutations went down or disappeared at a follow-up time point. As you can see with the blue arrows, some of these mutations are actionable also. So at diagnostic time point where we had mutations in these actionable genes, now, at the time of progression, we have lost this edge. So this means you cannot use the targeted therapy at a follow up time. point. Some drivers are maintained at constant frequency and perhaps are the driving force for maintaining the malignant clone. On the other hand, we did see a rise in the mutations in some other driver genes of which NRAS is significant because it is can be targeted using a targeted therapy. So you can see there is a change in the mutation landscape at different time points. Now, can this time, this change in the landscape be captured into some kind of patterns? So we find, found three different kind of patterns, a branching pattern, which was most frequent and in which there was loss of some mutation and gain of other mutations. We found another pattern which we call as the linear pattern where there was a progressive accumulation of more mutations and we found a third pattern which was a stable pattern where we found that initially there were more than one founder clones and as the time passed by even if the disease progressed one of the clone was more established and the other clone disappeared and some of the mutations also disappeared. 
So, like I said, the branching pattern predominated in myeloma. And when we tried to look at the which patients evolved with branching pattern, we found that patients who had lower tumor mutation burden at baseline tend to have a branching pattern of evolution. And but what is the clinical significance of knowing if the patient is evolving with a branching pattern? The significance is that it has been seen that these patients respond very well to emits. Emits are the immunomodulatory agents and which are like thalidomide, linalidomide, and then newer analogs. And they have been very, very effective in the treatment of multiple myeloma. Now there is another uh, concept where people say that, you know, when patients respond very well to the initial therapy and attain a stage of complete response where very, very few tumor cells are remaining, there is an immense pressure on those remaining tumor cells to expand. And the only way they can expand is by acquiring more mutation and losing some of the mutations which are making them vulnerable to the therapy. And that is why patients who tend to get into CR tend to progress with a branching pattern of evolution. So, and this corroborates with the clinical presentation because currently the type of treatment that we use for multiple myeloma, we are able to achieve complete response in two thirds of these patients. And similarly, two thirds of the patients evolve with the branching pattern of clonal evolution. So another thing that we looked at from the baseline to the follow-up sample was what is the change in the tumor mutation burden? You saw in the first slide where I showed you that from the pre-malignant stage of MGUS to overt multiple myeloma, there is progressive accumulation of mutations and the structural variations. So one would expect that you know the TMB and the mutations would increase from the stage of diagnosis to the stage of progression and relapse, but actually it is not so. It doesn't happen like this. With therapy, most of the clones disappear and only one or two which are able to sustain the onslaught of the chemotherapy that we are giving, they survive. So actually it is the TMB either remains stable or goes down and this is most significant in the hypermutators the fall in the TMB at the follow-up progression and relapse time point. So now I'll show you a few of these concepts using a case study. This was a 58-year-old male who presented with multiple lytic lesions, the standard features of multiple myeloma. So he was diagnosed as multiple myeloma and he was diagnosed as high-risk stage 3 myeloma based on the molecular genetic aberrations that we saw on fluorescent in situ hybridization. I'm going to show you in a little while. So this is the profile at baseline. He had an M band of one gram per deciliter. After four cycles of uh, VRD therapy, which is Velcade, Revlimid, and Dexamethasone. In brief about this therapy, Velcade is a uh, bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. Revlimid is lenalidomide, which is an imid, and Dexamethasone is a steroid. So you see, we give a combination of these three different agents to achieve the best response in this patient. So you can see that there is a fall in the M protein, which goes down now to 0.3 gram per deciliter. And after six cycles, it falls to zero. But let's look at the disease, what is happening to the clonal plasma cells. So this is uh, flow cytometric immunophenotyping. I'm showing you these graphs just to show you multiple clones at diagnosis using this technology also. So you can see magenta, green, orange and the green. These are three different clones. As you can see, they have different kind of expression of various antigens on their surface, but they are all show lambda light chain restriction, which tells us that they are secreting the similar same monoclonal protein. At the time of follow up, interestingly, you see another blue blob appearing. So there is a fourth clone which has appeared at this fall second time point. And this clone is different from the remaining three clones, as you can see in the la middle lane, last plot. This clone is restricted for kappa light chain. So there is a clonal evolution, there is acquisition. The three clones are there, but there is an acquisition of a fourth clone. At third time point, all the three clones have responded to the therapy and they have disappeared. 
Now the only clone remaining is this dark blue clone which we acquired at the second time point. Along with that, you can see these cyan colored normal plasma cells which show equal distribution for kappa and lambda light genes telling us that they are polyclonal, whereas you have one monoclonal this one. Now let's look at the genomics of these different clones. So this is the fluorescent in C2 hybridization where we have used the green signal represents the 17Q and the red signal represents the 17P, which is the site for TP53 gene. Now, uh, please follow my cursor here in the white circled cells, you can see two green and two red circles. So they have two copies of the 17P. Whereas if you look at the red circles, you have three copies of 17. Here you have three copies of the red signals. That means three copies of the 17P. And in the yellow, you can see four copies of the 17P. So that means you have three clones of plasma cells here some which have two copies, some which have three copies and some which have four copies. And on the right, you can see the relative percentage of these plasma cells in the patient. So I've shown you multiple clones using flow cytometry. I have shown you a genomic technique, the flor interface fluorescent in situ hybridization. Now let's look at the clonal evolution with next generation sequencing. So at the first time point, that is TP1, using the NGS, we could find that the cellular fraction of 40% is showing these three mutations, the RB1, DNAH5, and EGR1. But at the second time point, we can see two clones. Now this first clone has totally disappeared at the second time point, and this other clone has emerged which is showing these three mutations. Now let's look at the WAF or the cellular prevalence of these mutations here. You can see the CIRD and TP53 are present in less than 10% of the cells, whereas the IKZF is present in 70% of the cells and some others, HIST1, are present in 100% of the tumor cells. So there is so much of clonal heterogeneity, various cellular fractions showing various abnormalities. So what is the clinical relevance here? Now you can see that at the second time point, the patient has acquired a TP53 mutation, which is an actionable mutation, but it is present in less than 10% of the tumor cells. So am I going to use a targeted therapy against TP53 at this stage? Perhaps not because it is present in 10% of the cells only. What I am more concerned is 70% of my cells are showing IKZF mutation, which is pathogenic and which may make these cells resistant to emits. I am using an emit Revlimid. So the next question is, am I going to remove Revlimid from the treatment protocol? The answer is no, because I still have 30% of the cells which may be sensitive to this drug. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to add an actionable targeted therapy against TP53, I am not going to remove IMID, but I am going to add another agent such as daratumumab anti-CD38 antibody or some other uh, most advanced version of a uh, proteasome inhibitor to the drug regimen that I'm going to give to this patient. So this case tells us tumors are heterogeneous. They have different cancer cell fractions tumors do evolve with time, they acquire new mutations and they may exhibit clonal switch as we saw in this case. The new mutations may confer drug resistance or they may be actionable, but how much and when and when not to change therapy is the question that is that we need to understand. And an oncologist needs to take a call based on the available data. So in brief about what else, how else can genomics impact the management? Another way is to monitor these mutations through the disease course to understand the Im impact of the treatment that is being given to the patient and to decide on whether to continue the same treatment and to understand how much is the residual disease in the patient. 
So in this case, uh, on day one, I heard there was a question about B, how, to, how do you measure BRAF in the blood or in the patient sample? So another new and very sensitive technology is droplet digital PCR, which can, because it is sensitive, you can detect the mutations in the cell-free DNA that is in circulating in the peripheral blood. So as you can see, using this technology at the time of follow-up in this particular patient, we could detect the BRAF mutants dots, which are shown in blue here. There were only six copies per microliter, and in the lower sample, there were only seven copies per microliter. So we could detect the residual disease with by monitoring this mutation in these patients. So now the next concept that I'm going to talk about is the mutational signature. So what are these mutational signatures? First, we need to look at the single base substitutions. Single base substitutions are can be of six types, and C two T transitions are most common. And that holds true for patients who have low TMB or intermediate or high TMB or those within the non-synonymous as well as the synonymous mutations. So as you have seen, the CT3 uh, transition or the substitution is the most common across all the cancers. These C2T, these base substitutions, each base substitution will give rise to 16 different combinations. So overall, the six substitutions give rise to 96 mutational types or mutational signatures, and they have been associated with different mutagenic processes and are still being defined by various groups. So in our data set, we found the four signatures to be most frequent. And these signatures co corresponded to aging. The, we know that the myeloma patient, myeloma develops in patients about 50 years of age. Then there were more frequent uh, DNA repair signatures, tobacco related and apobec signatures. So when we try to correlate these signatures with the outcomes, we found that the presence of chemotherapy signatures and the absence of DNA mismatch repair signatures were associated with inferior survival outcomes in these patients. So whether these signatures can be used to modulate therapy is not known as of now, but yes, they do impact the survival outcomes in cancers. So, you know, we saw, we have been talking about the non-synonymous variations. So what exactly are non-synonymous variations? They are called non-synonymous because they result in the change in the codon and the codon, which translates into a different amino acid as a result of the mutation. So we wanted to look at how this mutational landscape is influencing the proteomic landscape of a tumor. So what we found was that there was a progressive loss in the as a result of mutations happening. There was a progressive loss in the codons which are coding for arginine. So that means there is a the tumor is trying to lose arginine. OK, so this has been shown by different other groups that there is a. Decrease in the codons coding for arginine as a result of mutations happening in the tumors. So let's look at the role of arginine in cancer. So the arginine is transported inside the cell using various transporters. And now it undergoes metabolism via different pathways. The transmetabolites or the intermediary products that are formed as a result of different pathways that these molecule takes to metabolize itself support oncogenesis in different ways. So on the other hand, some of these intermediate metabolites are trans are changed back or to the arginine itself using various enzymes. So these enzymes are very significant for the arginine cycle. In addition, the current knowledge also tells us that some of the genes which are frequently mutated in cancer also influence the arginine metabolic machinery. 
so through these metabolites arginine supports the tumor growth and therefore arginine depletion therapy could be a potentially anti tumorigenic therapy and the tumor as a matter of protective mechanism as the body is trying to create mutations to lose this arginine so then we looked at how this proteomic repositioning of arginine impacts survival outcome in our patients and we found that patients who had retained levels of arginine had inferior overall survival so apart from using this for our therapeutic purpose we also now know that it does have an impact as a prognostic marker so having seen all the this now let's summarize how the mutation landscape has impacted the treatment landscape of cancers we saw actionable signatures in 34% of the patients in this particular cancer and the percentage of patients with actionable cancers may vary from cancer to cancer but we know that actionable signatures do exist and they do not exist in all the patients another thing we looked at is that the cancer cell fraction varies it varies mutation to mutation patient to patient and clone to clone so a targeted agent against a single mutation may not be the requisite therapy for cancers and a combination therapy approach is the optimum solution we then looked at the clonal evolution so now we know that cancers evolve over time and they acquire new mutations these new mutations may confer drug resistance and thus or some of them may be actionable and thus we can modify our therapy if required based on this input another aspect of the clonal evolution is that you may lose some of the actionable mutations so you need to be do a repeat a ass genomic assessment at the time of progression and relapse or at the time when you are clinically thinking of changing therapy for a particular patient we also looked at the mutational signatures and now we know that specific mutational signatures are associated with discrete clinical outcomes the changes in the proteomic landscape are secondary to the changes in the mutational landscape and evaluating this we may find new therapeutic targets and through this mechanism we have found that arginine depletion may be a potential anti metabolite therapy at least for myeloma patients if not for all type of cancers so i'll end here by acknowledging my team at aims professor lalit kumar professor atul sharma dr gurvinder kaur dr jaina and dr lata i'm also grateful to my collaborators at triple iit delhi and this team is led by professor anima gupta I'm grateful to the funding agencies for generously supporting my work and to you all for a patient hearing and to the organizers for inviting me to share my perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. Thanks a lot for sharing such nice topic on clonal heterogeneity and somatic and clonal mutation we gained a lot. of information from your presentation uh, with due permission uh, may i uh, call uh, uh, for the uh, from the delegates to ask question ma'am yes sure okay ma'am thank you so participants please uh, write your questions your queries in the chat box so that i may ask from the ma'am I think Mr. Abhijit has something to ask. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, ma'am, uh, Dr. Abhijit asked you that uh, as you mentioned that C and T substitution are more common in most of the forms of cancer. So technically, it will be it will be never possible to develop new drugs for all that. So, what is your opinion for personalized cancer medicine? see uh, like i said we need to have we now have a whole basket of actionable mutations and a basket of actionable drugs 
So the concept of personalized medicine is you need to identify which mutation this patient has and to what proportion this patient has. So maybe like I showed in my presentation, some of the patients had multiple actionable mutations. So how do you combine that basket and make a combination therapy for a patient is the answer. So it is not going to be an OTC over the counter drug that, OK, my genome I have, my tumor genome, I have this mutation so I can take this medicine. No, it has to be a very well thought out uh, combination of various drugs by a trained oncologist who can decide on, you know, based on the information, which drugs would be suitable for this patient. So this is the concept of personalized cancer medicine. Anyone else? Okay, ma'am, thank you. Uh, no, ma'am, uh, no more queries. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, your very informative lecture, and I think uh, we will invite you time to time in future also. And thank you for highlighting on this uh, means multiple myeloma and also on personalized medicines, how to link between these things. Thank you so much, ma'am. We are very happy to have you within us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you once again. Have a nice day, ma'am.